please take a seat. We're wait, just waiting for Patrick to drop by. Okay. But um, first, make sure that you're comfortable. Grab something to drink. Uh, get a seat while the audience is also getting ready for you. Ah, oh, yeah, thanks. <coughs> That you always see, of course. If you're organizing the next web like Patrick is doing, you always have stuff to do also oh, in no. different places where you need to be. So, uh, okay. but I'm glad that you're all here. I have, I have one, thanks. What might be a good idea, basically, I think I would love to give you some room to basically introduce yourself, because I think it would really help for the audience to understand who they have in front of you and basically kickstart the conversation a little bit. So, um, uh, Duco, uh, may I ask you to give that a start? Sure. Um, so, I'm here, uh, I'm Duco, I'm from, from P11. We have a, a company that um, actually, uh, it all started with, with Square in the US, uh, so it's actually a company that helps uh, SMEs accepting card payments. Um, in Europe there was nothing like this. Um, of course you have the big banks providing people with, uh, um, yeah, with uh, card payment terminals, but there was nothing uh, specialized for, for SMEs. So we developed uh, software that you could download, uh, yeah, you could download the app on your phone for free, and then you have the, uh, the card payment device uh, which you connect via Bluetooth and you can accept card payments as you go, uh, without the fixed fees, without uh, the, the big contracts uh, that you have with banks. So it's, it's, it's easy and um, it, makes, makes, uh, it enables actually uh, small companies to, uh, yeah, to grow their business. So that's about it. Okay. Honor, please take it away. Yeah, I'm the CEO of Payment Wall. Uh, I don't know if you know about Payment Wall, but uh, we're kind of a hidden layer uh, on many games uh, or digital um, products. Uh, so we enable uh, these digital products to uh, receive payments from all over the world. Uh, we started off as a um, provider on Facebook. We got kicked off uh, in 2011, and then uh, we started uh, basically providing our services uh, off of Facebook. And uh, we now provide uh, services to games, uh, dating sites, uh, streaming content, um, TVs, and so on. Uh, and we're integrated onto many different platforms. Uh, so you can basically integrate Payment Wall and take payments from anywhere in the world. We have about 150 plus payment options. Uh, so uh, many people think that people uh, pay with credit cards all over the world, it's not true. Uh, it's only maybe in the Western world that people use credit cards. Uh, so we have all the alternative payment options. If you go to Brazil, if you go to Russia, if you go to China, if you go to Southeast Asia, we support all the cash-based payment options. And many of the people on Facebook, uh, unlike you, uh, uh, they don't have access to credit cards, so we basically focus on that. But we also process credit cards, uh, so that's what we do. Great. Well, thank you, Honor. So, Joel, could you tell us a bit about Ingenico and your background? Sure. Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm from uh, Ingenico. Um, how many people have heard of Ingenico? Fantastic. That's great. Um, so, as you guys probably know, then um, we our history uh, of the company is to process payments in the physical environment in the retail shops. So. Four out of ten times when you guys make a transaction in the store, you're probably using one of our terminals. Sometimes they may not be branded as Ingenico, uh, but it is provided by uh, Ingenico Group. And several years ago, they started um, applying that same type of knowledge and expertise into the online world, in the e-commerce world. So uh, with the merger of uh, two companies called Ogon and Global Collect, um, now we also do the same type of payment acceptance and payment processing um, for some of the biggest e-commerce players in the world. Um, annually speaking, we probably process about 65 billion, um, and that's a mix across the smallest advertisers and smallest merchants, all the way to some of the biggest retailers. Um, and um, I'm here today to, to try to interact uh, with you folks a bit more, to see how we can help you to provide you services uh, as well, to help you scale your business and optimize what you guys do. Um, I'm not a payments guy, so if you have any kind of really nitty gritty payments questions, don't ask me. You can I ask me. You can ask him or you can ask people from my team. I hear a uh, challenge. <laughs> but, um, you can have it, it's you. <laughs> I, I come from a digital marketing background um, and I spent a lot of my time in the past looking at how do we connect buyers and sellers. Um, and as we'll talk about today, hopefully, um, I'm trying to um, look at how we can apply that knowledge uh, to our business so we, we don't just become a payment processors for our, for our companies, but really help to uh, move up the value chain and, and work as partners with our merchants to see how we can not only give them more business, but also then process it at the very end. And happy to be here. Okay, great. Well, thank you for coming. And so uh, maybe already to kick it off before we, uh, we get Patrick ready to, uh, to storm in here at any moment. Uh, uh, so basically, if you look into basically uh, payment services, what kind of integrations would you actually find natural as a sort of additional services that would ride on the payment rails? I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities to, uh, to basically bridge 
ad additional administrative services or compliance services that might fit well on basically the infrastructure that you already have in place. I think that counts for all of you. Uh, could you elaborate a little, bit, a little bit on that, on what you think about that? Uh, maybe, sure. uh, Honor, would you like to oh, start? Or so? I can start. Uh, so uh, basically, I mean, depending on the clients we get, uh, we provide our services in a B2B manner, but then we support B2B2C um, transactions. So it's the users of our clients that pay to us, and then they have payments inquiries, and we support them, and so on. So uh, there's a lot of complexity, because we're an intermediary that's invisible to the end users, but at the same time, we get inquiries from them, uh, and you know, we have to be discoverable and so on. Uh, and then we also f support B2B clients where you have like marketplaces and so on. So you have, let's say, um, an Uber, which we don't work with, but um, let's say they have to pay their drivers. Um, so you have to collect money from the end users who ride the cars, and then you have to uh, make sure that the drivers are validated KYC'd, and then you have to submit the payments, uh, you know, on a regular basis to the drivers. Uh, so um, it creates a lot of complexity. So this is like a value-added service on top of uh, a payments provider. You're not just an API. You're not just a uh, payments gateway. You're not just a, uh, an acquiring bank, uh, you know, processor. You're the whole entire thing at once. Uh, so that's a big complexity. Now, Uber example is just one example. There's many more examples. Like games require different kinds of um, uh, services, like risk. You have a lot of users paying a lot of microtransactions. Like, let's say one user comes, pays uh, 20 times. Uh, you have to figure out if that, if that user is legitimate uh, really quickly because you need to give them the currency that they want inside the game, or you want to give them the weapons that they're trying to buy inside the game instantaneously. And if any delay happens, uh, your merchant that uses you is unhappy with you. So you have to keep constantly developing new technology, new uh, ideas, new uh, ways. Uh, to enhance that user experience, and those are the value-added services that you know companies like us all work on and you know build. Sure, um, you know I, I would probably say that uh, five, ten years ago, I mean, if you look at our company, we um, we were basically a technology service provider, um, something that the procurement uh, department would would come to us um, and interact with us. And more and more, as you see, kind of the company evolution. Um, we're, we're having much more C-level conversations now uh, because we have the terminal side, we have the offline piece. Because we have the online piece, there's a great omni-channel um, offer that we can now provide to our, to our, um, our merchants. Um, so I think that's, that's really interesting for us and that's, I think, evolving as, as uh, time goes on. Um, we want to make sure that it's really easy for our merchants to just hook up to us and, and start paying uh, immediately. Um, so, you know, APIs and SDKs that you mentioned, I mean, those are all, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, table salts now. I mean, you, you, know, you have to kind of be there and be doing that um, in order to be relevant. Um, but more and more now, you know, we, we are looking at how can we basically help the companies to expand, to create new business opportunities. Um, last year, we announced a partnership with Google. Um, Google has a great, uh, obviously, database of uh, consumer intent. Um, and if we match that with our payment data, that becomes really interesting to see how we can really match up supply and demand together, um, as well as help the merchants expand abroad. I mean, if you look at uh, companies that want to go international, one of the biggest single pain points is how the hell am I going to accept payments when I go to Bolivia or go to APAC region? Um, and that's where our offer can be quite uh, interesting for, uh, for the companies, because with one single contract, with one signature, with one kind of interaction with us, um, we can help them to scale globally across our 150, 170 countries that we operate in, um, be able to collect the funds in whatever local currencies that the consumer in those markets are transacting, and then dump that into your local bank account. So all of that administrative hassle um, is kind of taken away from, from, the, from the merchants um, by working with us. Um, and then I think third is not just uh, providing payment services, but also the intelligence uh, is really critical um, to make sure that payment is such a critical component of, of what we do day to day and what you guys do day to day in terms of your, your lifeblood, um, that we want to make sure that we provide the data and the information to you in your hands so that you can identify, hey, where can I optimize this or where can I realize better conversion rates? Um, and so we launched a, a, a BI platform called Elevate that really helps to hone in on those opportunities and makes it very simple and easy to use to figure out, okay, this is where I can really help to scale my business and, and grow conversions. So I think those are some of the, some of the ways that we are adding value Added services on top okay. of payments. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Ajay. I think some good insights. Duco, probably you also yeah. have some insights on this as well. <coughs> yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> so um, I heard a lot of uh, things that that we do the same or or different, but we we have the same challenges. Uh, so um, 
behind the curtains always always very complex, uh, but it should not be for uh, for the merchant, uh, our customers. So we uh, basically when you start a business, one of the first things uh, that comes in mind is you want to accept pet car payments. Uh, so when whether you are a plumber or a hairdresser or a taxi driver. So um, back in the days, you you went to a to a to a bank and. Um, and this bank uh, gave you a lot of forms uh, that you had to sign and uh, a lot of documentation. So we made this process very easy. So you go online to our website, uh, you sign up uh, for having a car payment device, uh, and actually um, then you can start accepting car payments. Um, we we do also a KYC. We have to do a KYC, otherwise uh, companies like Mastercard and uh, and uh, Visa are going to be very angry with us. Uh, but uh, so we we check all our customers, uh, and based on these checks, we can say, okay, uh, this is uh, of course this is the the guy who says he is his, uh, uh, or uh, we have a problem and we need some more information uh, to be able to let them continue to accept card payments. Um, so. Uh, basically, you can start right away, and that that's a that's a big revolution in card payments uh, because uh, you see, for SMEs, it was always very complex, very difficult to to, to start uh, accepting card payments, and now with with our device and uh, our easy easy process going online, and only uh, if it's necessary to get some additional information, we ask for the information. Uh, it makes it very easy to uh, start a business and start accepting payments. I think that's really important as well, indeed, that basically the threshold of start using yeah. payments for your business is actually becoming much lower. Yeah. And I think, Sajal, you touched upon an interesting point with regard to the use of data, right? So basically, we all know Google is very smart about everything we do, but not whether actually a transaction has taken place uh, in many cases. So basically, if you've searched for something, you'll be spammed forever with the one thing you've searched for and probably bought already. So how do you actually see the use on that? Uh, maybe to give it, elaborate a bit more on where you started on just now. What's, the, what's basically the whole privacy issues around basically making payment data available and what are the opportunities there? Yeah, so, um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, we're, we have to make sure that uh, PII is very well protected on our, um, um, in our business. I mean, at the end of the day, merchants trust us, the industry trusts us, and, you know, we would, um, it's the cornerstone of our business is, is trust. Um, so we have to make sure that, you know, when we, when we work with data, we are very much, you know, have to comply with regulations, comply with, you know, um, making sure that we protect the, the consumer's data. Um, but in an aggregate form, in, a, in, an, in an environment where we can actually um, anonymize the data, um, I think that provides us very valuable insights um, around, you know, what are the types of products and services that consumers are buying in the local markets, and where are there opportunities for businesses like yours to help to really push, you know, other different types of products and services uh, to the consumers. Um, and not only that, but it's also about the distribution of those products and services. So we think fanatically about how consumers are interacting with your businesses and making sure that we can provide the right types of services um, where the consumers are buying it. I mean, if the consumers are coming to your website and you want to transact there, then we can, we can help you with that. But if now they're going, going natively into other applications, into mobile applications, well, we need to make sure that we're allowing you to transact and do business in those environments. And so if you see kind of this fragmentation of, of commerce, um, then we need to provide those, those rights, products, and services to be able to enable those transactions and those interaction points between consumers and your businesses. And I think that's going to be the name of the game for the next uh, two, three years. Yep. Uh, definitely, I think very interesting. I think uh, how does it work basically if you look into, you're very active especially in the gaming world. Uh, so wh what kind of, do you see different demand there for example around these issues? Uh, I mean, in the gaming space you have uh, users basically who are addicted to you know, playing games. Uh, they play one game and they build up their profile uh, and they pay like a hundred times let's say. Uh, and then they change the game because one other game becomes popular so they have to change. Uh, the problem with, uh, with the payment side is uh, what happens to that user's profile on the uh, payment side when they switch the game from one to the other. Uh, that all disappears if you don't have one unified provider. Uh, so basically, a company like us uh, that accommodates all the, you know, all the whole gaming space uh, is able to look at that user's past profile and we're able to figure out uh, if they had committed any fraud, uh, if they had done any chargebacks, or if they had done anything bad. Uh, so we're able to port the profile without giving access to the merchant uh, to that information. 
Uh, so from a privacy standpoint, it's a dilemma, uh, you know, but at the same time, uh, since we are the holder of that information, we have access to it and we can use it. Uh, so we, you know, that's, that becomes our competitive advantage, I would say. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, interesting. And so so how, how about you? So basically, what kind of opportunity do you see in the data services? And for example, if you look in, into companies like uh, um, Cardlytics, right, so basically tracking already in the US uh, for a large part all payment transactions for commercial purposes uh, for advertising, what kind of, what, what do you see about those developments? What do you think about it? Uh, I first want to talk about uh, something else like uh, KYC, for example, uh, which is something that uh, is very interesting because uh, at one hand, uh, yeah, you know your customers and you know who's coming in. Uh, but since we are a young co uh, company, uh, at first we, yeah, we had a certain, certain vision and certain idea what, what kind of customers would come in. But in the end, everybody can decide to, uh, to sign up for a device. So uh, um, actually, if you compare that to, to companies that, that, that offer products in a supermarket, you never know exactly uh, who's <laughs> buying your products. And for us, it's very interesting to see uh, exactly what kind of companies uh, are getting into our company, uh, so are, are making use of our products, and also what kind of customers are the valuable customer. So is it a beautician? So what's the average transaction of, an, of a beautician? Uh, what's the average transaction of, uh, for example, a plumber? So you can then also say like, okay, where is a beautician doing sh his shopping? So then uh, that actually made us by the next to going online, of course, and targeting our customers via via Google AdWords and via Facebook, also think like, okay, uh, maybe there are some retail channels, uh, for example, for plumbers, where plumbers do their shopping, and that, that made us go also into retail and not only go online. Uh, and now, actually, our retail footprint is very big all over Europe, where we have uh, where we are in store with uh, retail packaging and uh, all the all the uh, marketing materials you can think of uh, to actually target exactly the, the customers we like and we know that the quality of these merchants is, is good. So uh, yeah, that's very good. Okay, well, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a fair, it's an interesting standpoint. And definitely also, you see that basically, this is where you begin to see the difference between your companies, right? So that's one of the difficulties usually in payments. People tend to think that all payment companies are pretty similar, but they're actually very different. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that's, that's uh, pretty much inevitable to mention is basically something like uh, blockchain, right? I mean, everyone's buzzing about it, uh, but I think it will be interesting to hear your perspective on whether or not you actually think it makes sense to look at it from your business perspective currently, and maybe what kind of time frames you think that would be attached to that. So uh, who would like to give that a start to give a few words? Yeah, Otto, please go <laughs> ahead. Uh, so um, blockchain and Bitcoin is kind of an interesting topic. Um, uh, you know, when you have merchants uh, in the innovative space, like, you know, building games or digital content or websites, uh, they always come and they want to be at the forefront of uh, technology. So they want to integrate uh, uh, Bitcoin onto their uh, website and they want to process Bitcoin payments right away. Uh, but of course, uh, they don't really think about compliance uh, risk, uh, you know, when it comes to onboarding them uh, and the risks that we face as a payment provider. Uh, basically, uh, payment providers rely on banks uh, to store the money. And uh, banks in the United States especially um, have gotten, I don't know, some, uh, you know, they made a decision basically to not onboard any Bitcoin clients. Uh, so if you're trying to process payments as a payment processor, and if you uh, indicate uh, at any point in time uh, on your website, on your marketing materials, or anything else that you touch Bitcoin or you do anything with Bitcoin, your bank account would be shut down and you won't be able to provide any more services to anybody. So it's a big risk for a payment provider to say that they're providing you know, services. There's some banks that cater to the Bitcoin audience. There's like a few companies um, that have decided to become Bitcoin exchanges, uh, but regulation still um, is you know, kind of behind. In the United States, uh, New York, I think, uh, was trying to uh, figure out a way uh, to regulate uh, Bitcoin providers. Uh, as you know, in the United States, um, uh, you have the FinCEN, and then you have uh, 50 plus regulators for each state. Uh, so if you want to be a payment provider, you have to be licensed in 50 states plus uh, by the FinCEN. It's not like the European Union where you can go get a license from one uh, European Union country. You can passport the license. Uh, in the United States, you have to get licenses from each of these um, uh, divisions uh, and so on. And you don't have that many sophisticated people there that understand Bitcoin technology. So uh, they're really afraid and they look at uh, California and they look at New York uh, to lead uh, you know, the decision making process for financial technology. And even New York is you know, having challenges uh, making a decision about well, how to handle Bitcoin. So you have this thing that trickles down basically from the uh, you know, uh, government down to the banks and then uh, from the banks uh, to the uh, payment processors. 
uh, and then there's only um, what is it called? Uh, there's two companies, Coin. Uh, uh, this took a BitPay and there's one more company basically that provide um, Bitcoin services. Uh, they're quasi regulated, but again, uh, is your money safe with them? I don't know. So if we uh, piggyback on them, uh, we basically usually just uh, gateway into them and then we just allow the transactions to go to them and the merchant has to take on the risk. Um, if their you know, money is gone one day, they're bankrupt, uh, they run out of VC funding, we can't really help them out. But you can't you can get away with that basically from a regulatory perspective. By yeah, because we're just a gateway. Out. Yeah, so yeah. that's how we handle that. Uh, and in, in some jurisdictions, uh, Luxembourg, for example, I think uh, in the European Union, uh, of course, uh, lost a lot of the customers that it had uh, because, you know, no longer in the European Union, they can be the go-to destination for VAT tax avoidance. Uh, so right now they're trying to attract more financial technology companies and they're more open to Bitcoin, they said. Uh, Japan was more open to Bitcoin, but I think after the collapse of uh, the biggest big, big Bitcoin exchange, yeah, Mount Cox, uh, Mount yeah. Cox uh, they basically said that Bitcoin is kind of evil, so they're staying away from it. So there's a lot of controversy uh, around Bitcoin. I don't know if you, you know, um, want to go or take this risk and, uh, you know, uh, say you're a Bitcoin provider or you provide Bitcoin and so on. Uh, but it's a cool technology. Blockchain, blockchain is a cool technology. Uh, and the banks are uh, embracing this. And more and more banks are trying to figure out how to avoid um, uh, using SWIFT as a network to transfer money uh, between themselves. So, yeah. uh, well, because it's costly. No, indeed, indeed. And definitely there's some work to be done there on the infrastructure side. But, uh, but Duco, what do you think? Uh, yeah, that's a very, very long story. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's interesting to hear because it's a, t a totally different view. But also, of course, a, a totally yeah, payments com companies are different. Uh, for us, Bitcoin is, um, uh, yeah, it's actually for forget about it. Uh, again, uh, we, are, we are focusing on, on SMEs. Um, so think about the baker on the uh, street corner. Um, okay, um, so... Do you, do you need bitcoins? I, I don't think so. Uh, so actually, actually, there are bitcoin companies that like the, the European and actually uh, kind of global footprint we, we have and the, the, f the fact we're growing and they like to get uh, engaged with us and, and say like, okay, can we please make sure that your payment device also can accept bitcoins? But uh, if, you, if you talk about relevance, uh, yeah, it's, it's very low. If, if you talk about like uh, for trading uh, for yourself, yeah, maybe it's interesting, but uh, as um, uh, yeah, as uh, as a valuta, I think uh, as 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 uh, yeah, if you compare to, for example, uh, as money, as money, as yeah. money, then uh, then actually uh, yeah, it's very volatile and uh, yeah. So if you want to take the risk, go for it. But um, yeah. And if you take it to the infrastructure layer, basically, right? So think about it from a blockchain perspective. Is that something you already look into? Is it basically something that no. will come ba basically further on in the growth that you? No, for now, for now, for now, it's not something we, we want to focus on. If you look at, uh, I, f I think many of you do know that an IT pipeline uh, can get very, uh, very full, and uh, yeah. and this is something yeah, we have to really focus on the things uh, our customers want. And, uh, and and Bitcoin is really and blockchain is nothing that uh, a, a hairdresser is, is wanting right no, now. No, I fully <laughs> agree. I definitely uh, think about that. So, so, so John, what do yeah, you no, think? I, mean, I, I completely agree with uh, Duco and the uh, owner. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, you know, we want to support businesses and how they want to allow consumers to pay online. Um, and frankly, we're just not seeing um, as much demand for, for, and I think because maybe they have the similar types of concerns uh, owner that you had described. Um, so they also um, are a, a bit wary of, of accepting these types of uh, forms of payment. Um, and so we just want to make sure that we we can support them and there's a lot of other let's say uh, localized payment methods that I think are a bit more relevant a bit more secure um, and a bit more trustworthy um, and those are the ones that we want to focus on and I think for your businesses um, I think uh, those are the ones that are going to be most relevant uh, as you grow either in your local markets or internationally okay thanks <clears throat> so basically we're trying to leap ahead into the future right so I think you're, you're servicing payments from a completely different angles, but I think it might be nice to give you give us just a bit of a sight on where you think, what will be the next step, where you actually be surprising customers on sort of the user experience, how it will change. I mean, everyone's talking about what Uber is doing to payments, and not as much about the technology behind it, but more about the experience that they're actually delivering. How do you actually see that evolving from your perspective? What, what kind of, basically, user experience changes will people here perhaps experience in the, in the near future? Could you elaborate on that a bit, Sergio? Sure, sure. Um, well, so, how many people here think that this is the future of payments? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Hands down, no? please. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, no, so yeah, I need to have a conversation with the guys, Patrick and stuff. <laughs> um, but uh, indeed, I mean, I think um, for the future, for us at least, um, 
payment is, you won't even notice that the payment has occurred. It's going to be almost um, indistinguishable from, the tra from a, a consumer standpoint, traversing through the website or traversing through an app or being on their, their most popular social media application. You won't even know that actually I made a payment. It'll be so seamless uh, of an experience. I mean, right now when you're, when you're going through and you kind of get to the payment part, it looks like this old, clunky, 1980s like uh, designed website um, that you have to kind of put in your details. I mean, it just, it's, it's a shock experience. I mean, any, UI, any UX expert uh, will, I think, uh, kind of crun cringe uh, at those kind of uh, implementations. So for us, at least, you know, we're, we're really moving towards a, a beautiful kind of seamless experience that fits very natively within a, your kind of uh, websites or your kind of apps um, and making it so easy uh, to basically authenticate yourself and be able to make that payment. Um, and I think that's going to really help to, to push payments uh, in a more ubiquitous manner uh, rather than kind of all centralized onto the merchant's website. Yep. It'll be out there. You could be um, you know, tweeting and you're making a payment. You could be in Facebook and Messenger and, and make a payment and buy something. Um, already in Pinterest, you, know, you can buy pins. Um, and that's really the direction that we, we are, are looking towards um, as, as really kind of expanding out the distribution of payments and making it more ubiquitous. Okay, great. Well, thanks a lot. Um, Honor. Yeah, uh, I mean, the few trends that I see in the payment space are the following. One is um, uh, more, more and more compliance, uh, more and more regulation. Uh, so basically, uh, the United States government is trying to uh, stop the terrorists from transferring funds from one another. Uh, the United States government is also trying to collect more taxes uh, from people who are trying to evade taxes. Uh, so uh, basically, the banks uh, have been fined in the past few years billions of dollars, the biggest banks in the world have been fined bill billions of dollars and uh, it's becoming more and more difficult um, to uh, transact uh, in a cross-border way because of compliance. Uh, so what's going to happen next is um, each uh, region, like you know, European Union, United States, uh, and then uh, the, the unions that are not formed, like ASEAN and so on, uh, are all going to try to figure out a way uh, to create a unified system uh, for people to, uh, you know, create payment services and uh, banking services, KYC, compliance, and all this stuff. So I think that's the biggest trend that's going to influence our industry. It's going to influence the way that the merchants are onboarded because each and every merchant is going to have to jump through hoops uh, or uh, is going to have to go and create entities in different countries and create uh, complex tax structures and so on. Uh, so that's number one trend that's going to impact all of us. The second one is uh, emerging markets. Uh, as you've seen, uh, you know, PayPal is pounding its chest saying that they have 180 million customers. Great for them. Uh, we have 200 million plus customers at Payment Wall because we have a lot of users who have paid to us uh, with different payment options. Uh, people pay with cash, people with, pay with alternative payments. Dutch people don't pay with credit cards, they pay with Ideal. Uh, we can do a survey, I think 80% uh, of you are going to raise your hand uh, saying that you pay with Ideal. So um, if you look at the whole world, uh, only about maybe 15% uh, of the world's population uh, has access to credit cards. Uh, so um, if you look at emerging markets in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, only 1 to 5% of the population has credit cards. Uh, so uh, when we talk about innovation, uh, the, the sole focus of our conversation, especially in the Western world at conferences, uh, is focused around credit card payments, uh, NFC piggybacking on credit card payments, uh, or uh, you know, technology so that we can pay with credit cards at a store, or technology so we can pay with credit cards online. Uh, but in the emerging markets, you have this um, uh, problem with credit. Uh, people cannot get credit at the banks because they don't have credit rating systems. Uh, so there will be no system built uh, that's going to enable Vietnamese people to have credit cards at mass. Uh, so um, what I that means is there's a big opportunity. To keep it a bit short, yes. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, we won't be able to hear what Duco has to add to this. But uh, did he <laughs> the third one, the one th sentence? Yeah, the third, the third one is. So first one was compliance. Second one was uh, alternative payments. The third one is us, you know, the technology that piggybacks on uh, payments that makes uh, payment processing easier and easier uh, for people who have credit cards. Okay, great. I fully agree. Thanks. Yeah. No, I okay. think that's that's a good point, and I think also that if you if you look at uh, at innovation in payments, that 
Uh, payments is actually, it's, it's all marketplaces, right? So uh, you're talking about credit cards. Yeah, for, for Europe, we're talking about innovation. It's like, how can we, uh, how can we integrate credit card payments in the, in the total picture? But uh, yeah, looking at Africa, it's total, totally different uh, different story. Um, so so, so that is, that's interesting to see. And I think you have more experience with like, like the global, the global over overseeing. Uh, but we, uh, we are in Europe uh, uh, are thinking like, I, I think it's a bit more like Ingenico in, in a, in a, in a in a, in a in a way that uh, that payments um, that that we're gonna gonna look to payments like uh, it, it will be gone uh, it will be gone for the customer on a certain moment you will be doing payments but you don't know you're doing payments what? exactly yeah. uh, so I fully agree but actually one very important aspect to that is trust right yeah, yeah, yeah I think sure. you talked about it also from a gaming perspective but basically I mean I think and this I think most of the surprising things is not about basically the, the, for example what uber does is not the experience but basically the, the fact that people actually trust uber of dealing well with their customers yeah. and I think that's uh, something well great that you're working on that and I think it's also great that you shared your knowledge here today because indeed the uh, time is up so we're heading for a break right now but please give a very big hand to Duco from payleven from Sajal from Genico and Honor from Payment Wall.